tonight. Amen. What a good looking class here tonight. Amen. 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 That'll get you going. Oh, appreciate all of you coming out. Thank you guys for keeping us in there on the uh, on the Facebook. I'm getting my memory out here so I can go over and grab it. Wait a minute. I wrote them down. <laughs> the last time I put it on the phone and I couldn't read them because the phone was up here. So I thought I'm gonna start writing them down. So I use the phone I haven't wrote it down. So I wrote them down, forgot I wrote them down. That's all right. Uh, I'm, I'm glad God put it together so I don't have to remember to breathe. I'm glad it just happened. Uh, uh, all right. Ron Dean called me this afternoon. We're going to pray for Brother Ron. And he's got degenerative spine disease and three discs in his neck. And he's, he's been seeing his doctor and they're wanting to, they're wanting to do surgery, but they want to try the, the, the shots before they do that. And he wants us to pray that, that the doctor would go ahead and, and just do the surgery. He said they did a shot and it didn't work. Uh, you know, it didn't, so hopefully they can go ahead and, and get that get that done. He said he was in, in a lot of pain. Who is that? So just pray for Brother Rod. Rod Dean. Oh, okay. Brother Rod. Continue to pray for Cameron and Bradley. We got an update from Karen just while ago. Uh, they still keeping him sedated. They're keeping him sedated until his heart function builds up. Uh, the left side of his heart is not, is not changed. It's not building up any. But the right side is beginning to progress. It's beginning to build up some. So they're still trying to keep him sedated until they can get that, get that up and, and going. But he is, he is stable. So they're continuing to... To keep him knocked out on purpose, but if you would just continue to pray for Camden, Camden and Jeremy and, and Chloe and Carmen and, and the whole family. We thought and saw Linda McCone today, Sister Linda. She's making good progress. She's uh, she says she's frustrated with not being able to put her words together. You know, but but I can understand that. But she does a good job with it anyway. It just takes you know she thinks about it. But I'm, I'm so, so thankful that God has drawn her to the he has. And, and I told her, we're believing she's going to be at the Christmas party. That's, what, that's our belief and our goal that she'll be able to get out and be here. And she's believing with us for that. Georgia Jackson, I went and saw her and Tom. Uh, talked to Vanessa. Vanessa said that her kidneys are failing and that Tommy's was also. But that her potassium had went up, that was one of the big reasons she was hospitalized so or had went to the hospital. Uh, but, but she told her, she said, you know, that she's not going to do dialysis or anything. So she said she could just continue on as she is, no way to, to say, you know, that this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Uh, just to continue on doing what she's doing. And Sister Georgie is still Sister Georgie. She's in good spirits and doing well. So. We're just trusting and believing she's going, to, she's going to get through this thing. Mavis Sage, Sister Mavis, has got cataract surgery coming up at the end of the month. And Sarah Martin, I sent a prayer request out for her. I talked to Diane today. Everything went well with her surgery and said she's, she's recovering at home and, and doing well. So she wanted to thank all of us for the prayers. And Sandy Dean wants to thank all of you for praying for her. She, she's recovered well from from her surgery and all she's had to go through as well. So, a lot, a lot going on. So, keep the Johnny Daniel family in your prayers. Uh, work with Johnny. Just live down the road from him over there. I uh, was at the viewing a while ago. So, pray for his family to see him. He passed away. So, somebody you want to pray for, uplifted hand, or maybe you want to, if you want to mention, remember Brother Billy's wife, Sister Betty. Uh, he said they had changed some of her medication. She's having some issues with her sugar again. So we're just praying that, that God touches her and gets that regular. Pray for my sister Robin. She's back in hospital again. Robin Harry. Right, okay. All right. Is she in with them? Yeah. All right. Is Ron still nursing home? If you ask, he's at the hospital in West Angeles 
moving back into the nursing home. Okay. Well, apologies. Okay. So what else? <coughs> yeah. Remember my brother-in-law, he's got a, a mass on his pancreas. And they called me this afternoon and told him it was cancer. But he didn't know what stage or even yet it's going to be. <coughs> he's prayed that they could do something for him. Amen. Darlene's he's brother. To, he's trying to take care of his wife. She's got dementia. Oh, no. And it seems like families have a time. We get one, especially the other, just a struggle. Yeah. So what else tonight? Remember Judy and Dennis. Yeah. Judy and Dennis. Got to talk to them Saturday. Saw them over here. Judy and Dennis were working. <clears throat> so what else? Let's go to God in prayer to see. Most gracious Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we thank you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just thank you, Father, for the wonderful blessings you bestowed upon us here. We were able to be in your house this evening. We realize there are many who would like to be here and they're not able to. Thank you for those who give us in and join us on Facebook. Those who follow up on YouTube or if you just answer, I'm sure that they have and things they would like for us to pray now as well. So we just, we just take that into account. We know that you hear them too. But tonight we pray for every one of these that we have named all for and those who are represented by the uplifted hand because we know that, that you are a good God. We know you not only just listen to us, but you answer our prayers. So we thank you for all you've already done for those who are failing and the progress of any of them have made because of you. Touch them. We pray that you just continue to touch them because we know that you're still alive. And we know that you still do the same work you did when you were here on earth physically. You still do it by way of your Holy Spirit. So we're just trusting and believing tonight that you're going to touch and minister to each one of these that we, we have named all. Now, as we continue in the service, Holy Spirit, as always, you just have your way among us. Because we're here to glorify God and lift up the name of Jesus, and we know that you will help us do that. We will give you the praise and the glory for it all, Lord Jesus. In your name we ask it. And the saints would say, We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Brother Randall. Father, my goodness, and bless and not a burden. And to the front, no more. And I have to go to the other side of the land. I know. Make this fun of us grateful in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randall. Brother Rod Hughes and Sister Mary accompany me on the piano. <laughs> As you remain seated, let's sing 168. Oh, how I love Jesus.
I read an article a while back when we say that God is love and the Bible tells us that God is love. In order, in order to say that, there has to be an object to show that love to. There has to be to, to just say it wouldn't have a meaning unless there was some way to prove it. So when God is love, he is the object of love. It, it is him and him alone. And by sending Christ to die for us, it's just, well, it's just a dove in the yard. What anyone could, could really imagine in, in the form of love. But I'm glad he did that. I'm glad he did. All right, week number 52 a year's worth of Acts Bible study. How about that? Once a week for 52 weeks. I'm telling you, they go quick. It doesn't seem like that. doesn't seem like to me it's been, been quite that long, but it does, it does pass fast. So we're in chapter 21. We're going to look at the first 14 verses. I had started to go on past when I looked back through it this afternoon, but I thought, no, I think we'll just stick with these 14. And then we'll get in next week to, to even a few more, 15 through 25. But starting at, at chapter 21, and of course we pick it up right here, Luke is has picked it up for Paul and you know, he came to Miletus and then he called the elders of Ephesus down there and explained to them about the gospel he had preached and pretty much put the responsibility on them that they were going to have to carry off because he was wanting to go to Jerusalem and he wanted to be there by, if he could make it, by the day of Pentecost. So after, of course, he had prayed with them and he left them and then that's when he decided to go and said they accompanied him to the ship. And then Luke picks it up, chapter 21, and he says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, we were running a straight course, we came to Cos, and the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Now I gave you I gave you a map. It's a pretty good map that I text you if you can read it. You can see as, as he goes through these places how he, how he went. And then finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left. That's that island that that line goes by on your map, that's Cyprus. We sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there, the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. And the disciples they found, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Luke says, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children Till we were out of the city, and then we knelt down on the shore and we prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, the P is silent, Ptolemaeus. We greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the evangelist. Remember him? He was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. Now, Philip, this man, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt and he bowed his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem buy the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands 
of the Gentiles, of the Romans. Now, when we heard of these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, and he said, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying the will of the Lord be done. Amen. Boy, it's getting happy, isn't it? Get it done. Sister Jones, would you pray for us? Father, we thank you that we have the word today to open up and listen to and meditate upon it, to know what our forefathers went through before us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would take note of the persecutions that they went through and help us today, Lord, in the day and hour that we live, not to be afraid of where we are, but that it would make us stronger in you, Lord. It would make us to build up our hope and our trust and our faith in the God who saw Paul through his persecutions. We know where our place of abode will be one day if we keep ourselves true and faithful to the Father in heaven. We pray for Pastor as he continues to teach us this word, Lord, open up understanding to us and a greater determination in our lives to follow you with all our hearts, minds, soul, and being. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. And we put in another plug for that serving women in need, which will be coming up this Sunday at 5 o'clock at our fellowship hall. Uh, and, and as I said before, that's for everybody. That's not just for our church or just for church folk, but we encourage anyone who, who would like to attend. You're, you're more than welcome to come. I, I think Sister Jonas has got a, good, got a good plan for this ministry. I, I'm excited about what, what God's going to do. With it, I, I can't help but think back to the street ministry when, when we began that and how we started out with that and, and how it was, well, we wonder how this is going to go and how it's going to turn out. And my goodness, you know, look, look at a girl in the parking lot with those two big buses. So we know what God is able to do when he decides to do something. So we're excited about where that's going to take us. All right, let's look at these, these first 14 verses in chapter 21. And as I said, things are starting to get starting to get a little hairy or a little different. You know, when we start down in the book and, and we start, you know, we see the day of Pentecost and we see how God added to the church and those who were being saved. And then we follow him through and then we end up hearing that they all came together in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and that God's grace was upon them. And they were all joyful. Well, it wasn't long. It wasn't long until Satan stuck his nose into the mix. And come to find out, the Greek widows who were a part, the Jewish widows that they call the Hellenists, that were in there from Greece, uh, of course, they made an issue because they weren't getting served their daily allotment from the food bank. That's the best way I know how to put it. And it could have caused a big division within the church. If it hadn't been handled correctly, you would have had two churches. You would have had the, the well, you do have the Greek Orthodox Church today, but you would have had two Christian churches, one for the Hellenists and one for everybody else. But the disciples were smart, the apostles, and they prayed. And the Holy Spirit led them to appoint seven men as as deacons to take care of resolving that issue and they would continue to study and teach the word of God which is how the plan went and of course we found out that the saying please the whole multitude and trust me when everybody is pleased it's got to be the Holy Spirit all right so that's that's who it was and then they, they moved on from there and as the church began to grow we saw that they all began to sell stuff that they had because the church was growing, it was getting bigger, and a lot of people that were coming into the church were poor people and didn't have didn't have enough. So those who had 
And some of them had land and he went and sold it. Barnabas being one of them, I believe he was he was the example to them. He, he's a son of encouragement. And they began to sell their property and put the money into the church. And then they would help those who needed help out of those funds that came into the church. So there again, those who were in the church would not have any need, but they would be provided for physically as well. Well, it wasn't long. So Satan started something else. And he moved upon a couple of people, Ananias and Sapphira, who had some land, and they sold it. But what they did is they lied about how much they, they got for it. And they, they said they got this set amount for it and brought that to the disciples. Well, the Holy Spirit had, had revealed it unto Peter that that wasn't the case at all. And then when he addressed them about that, then, of course, the Lord, and I say the Lord, struck them dead. It killed, killed Ananias first and then, and then his wife. And I know that sounds cruel. I mean, that sounds kind of harsh for a God to do that. But understand something. This church has to be a church of integrity. It, it can't just be a church on the surface. It's got to be a church of integrity. And if you've got, if you had people in that church that belong to that church who had lied to the Holy Spirit and who had fooled the disciples, Satan already has a foot in the door on that church. And it's not pure. And it's not going to lead to what God wanted it to lead to. So God took Barney Fox's advice. He nipped it in the bud. He killed both of them. And when that happened, we learned, Luke says, that fear spread among all the people. Well, yeah, when you find out that this loving God, this gracious God, can also do this, <laughs> when, when you go against him, that that caused that some fear to arise. And that happened. And then Paul and him began to, to move on their journey. After that had happened, Paul had been persecuting the church tracking them down, trying to kill them because he believed they were a bunch of heretics. And we have found out from Paul's own testimony that he, he, he was ignorant, he says, that he sincerely believed that he was doing God a favor by, by squelching this movement because he didn't, he didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. He didn't believe that. If you read the Gospels, it tells us that the guards... You know, the pilot told the guards to make up a lie <clears throat> and, and paid them off to tell them that somebody had stolen his body. And the gospel writer said that there are people who believe that even to the day the gospel was written. So Paul was one of those. And he thought that what he was doing was snuffing out another movement that, that had been brought on <clears throat> just by this man's heresy, just through Christ. And then, of course, when... The Jews agreed with him, and they gave him warrants. That's the documents of the papers. He was on his way to Damascus, and he was going to arrest some more of them and bring them back and have them stoned, just you know, just so they would be killed. And of course, on the road to Damascus, we learned that Jesus knocked him off his high horse, as they had used to say. And no doubt, they may have been on horses, but either way. He still knocked Paul off his high horse in the sense that he thought that he was doing the right thing. And then when Paul realized that Jesus was alive and, and he was resurrected, then he knew that all this that they had thought about him was true. And then God was able to use him, Christ was able to use Paul by filling him with his Holy Spirit and thereby taking the message to the rest of the world. And we can say the rest is history. And we know the story and we've learned that every time they every time they have an impact, every time it seems that the church is beginning to get to get larger, the boundaries are beginning to extend, Satan always does something to try to stop that. And then the last time we saw it was in Ephesus when he came together with this big riot. And and he they would have killed Paul if he had went into that in that auditorium, if he had went into that arena, they would have killed him. And he wasn't, he wasn't allowed to go in there. And they sent him out so that he wouldn't get killed. But then later on, he goes back 
But outside of that, he goes to Miletus. And now he's continuing because he wants to go to Jerusalem to be there at the day of Pentecost. And now when, when he's on his way there, once again, Satan is, is going to try to prevent that from happening, just like he tried to prevent Jesus from getting to Jerusalem. Remember when Christ was born? Here he had all the babies two years and under killed. So Satan had made an attempt to stop Christ many times, even using the apostle Peter one time. When Peter stood up and said, you're not going to Jerusalem, you're not going to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, they're not going to beat you and smoke you and you know, crucify you, that's not going to happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Because ever, ever plan that he had, Satan tried to stop it. So on your notes here, we pick up, Paul is determined to go to Jerusalem. And Luke tells us that he was warned what was going to happen to him if he went there. But he never heeded their warnings. Now, scholars, and I am not one, scholars differ on why he chose not to listen to the warnings. Well, I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul would not have done anything against the will of God. Some, some say that the reason, the, the reason he did get beat and the reason all of this did happen is because he didn't heed their warnings. Well, let me ask you this question. What would have happened to the church if he had? It, it would have just stopped at Miletus. It wouldn't have went any further. The gospel wouldn't have got spread any more than it did. But that wasn't the plan at all. So when, when they seemed to think that Paul did not listen to the warnings, I, I have to say to them, they're not looking at the big picture. They're, they, they're just zeroed in on maybe a verse or two of what's taking place, and they don't look at the big picture. If they did, they would see why, and that's what you and I are going to see. In verses 1 through 4, leaving Miletus, all right, <clears throat> when he had left there, he crosses the Mediterranean Sea, and he lands in Tyre. Now, they stayed seven days in Tyre, and the disciples there, they had told him through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, the wording in the Greek when it says that we found disciples in Tyre, that word could, could also mean they were looking for disciples in Tyre. That they could have been searching out a church. But either way, they found those disciples, spent seven days with them, and while they were there, these disciples told him, they said, you know, through, through the Spirit, they said, you, you shouldn't go up to Jerusalem. They warned him in verse 4. They told Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. They were warning him, and had Paul understood it to be a direct command from God, he would not have gone. I don't have my sheet mark. I better look out for this one when I get it. Had Paul on your, to fill in the blank, had Paul understood it to be, <clears throat> had Paul understood it to be a direct command from God, he would not have gone. He had got the warning from these disciples that <clears throat> he didn't heed that warning. But notice he didn't argue with them. You know, there's several other places in the Bible when Paul was determined to go somewhere or another, the Holy Ghost or God spoke to him not to go. Mm -hmm. So these people were warning him, you know, sent by the Spirit mm -hmm. not to go to Jerusalem, but that he hadn't heard from the Lord. There you go, Charles. There you go. That's, that's, that's the key part to it. So, you know, the scholars, the the arguments on both sides of that, which amounts to nothing. The arguments on both sides of that, which would be number one, was it really through the Spirit? Well, Luke said it was. I mean, if it wasn't through the Spirit, I don't think God would let Luke put that down. I don't, Luke didn't say, in my opinion, it was through the Spirit. 
So the scholars say, was it really a fruit of the Spirit that they bore him since he went anyway? Or did Paul just, just say, nah, I ain't listening to you? Well, it was through the Spirit that he that he was warned. But we're going to see, we're going to see how that worked and why that was. If you look in Acts chapter 20, which we just did, uh, the verses 20 through 24, I think probably a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, but you can just flip over that page. And if you look at verses 20 through, through 24, now think about the fact that they had warned him not to go to Jerusalem, but look what he said in chapter 20. He said in verse 22, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. And of course it's a small s not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. The Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. He said the Holy Spirit testifies in every city what awaits me. So here he's in the city of Tyre, and they're fulfilling the scripture because they're testifying to him not to go to Jerusalem. So what they're really doing is confirming it to him. That they're warning him from their own accord because they don't want him to go, but he doesn't take it as a warning. He takes it as a confirmation, as a confirmation. So that's, that's the difference in, in the saying, well, he didn't obey the Spirit. Yes, he did. He did. It was just the fact he knew what the plan was. And verses 5 through 9, <clears throat> when they had come to the end of the days in Tyre, they departed and they went. And, of course, the, the city followed them out. And then they got on, they prayed with them, they got on the ship and they left. And then they, they came to Ptolemaeus, Ptolemaeus, and greeted the brethren there and stayed with them for a day. And then on the next day, Luke says, we who were Paul's companions. It means all of them didn't go. But they departed and came to Caesarea. And entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. And this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Yeah, and you can look on your map there and you'll see that Caesarea is the last stop before Jerusalem. It's, it's the last stop. The next stop is Jerusalem. So continuing the journey, they stopped in two more cities. And Caesarea being the last one before he would enter into Jerusalem, and that is where Philip lived. And Philip was the evangelist. If you go back and you see where the seven deacons were appointed that I talked about, because the widows weren't getting their daily allotment, Philip was one there. And then we follow Philip, and we find that he had went down out of Jerusalem, and that there was an Ethiopian sitting in a wagon reading the book of Isaiah, and Philip, that's why it's called an evangelist. Philip was able to evangelize probably a whole nation through that one fellow who took that word back to his queen about Christ. And Philip lived in Caesarea, and it's interesting that, that Luke tells us that he had he had four daughters here. He said this man had had four daughters, four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now Luke doesn't say this is on your note. Luke does not say that these women said anything to Paul. He doesn't say that they they warned him or anything in regards. Luke just makes mention of the fact that they were prophets, that they had prophesied in the past. He, he had four daughters who, who were prophetesses. Well, is that a surprise? 
that you would find four ladies who were who were prophets or prophetesses in that day. Not if you go back to the day of Pentecost. If you go back to the day of Pentecost, as you see where, pre, where Peter preached, and he quoted what Joel had written in the Old Testament, do you remember what he said about men servants and maid servants and your sons and your daughters would do what? Prophesy. So here again, Luke is telling Theophilus, just like he's telling us, the scriptures are being fulfilled. It's happening just as it started at Pentecost. When he said that, that in those days your sons and daughters would prophesy, Luke says, oh, by the way, by the way, Philip has got four daughters who are prophets, and they prophesy. So on the one hand, you say, well, I, I can see when women have a part in the church, don't you? Uh, I know the apostle had talked about it, and I know there's always been arguments over the fact of uh, what part they play and how the parts play into it. But there again, you have to look at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture of it, you realize that there's more to it than just meets the eye because the women here were prophets as well who were able to prophesy. And they were able to, to spread the gospel and to be a part of who the church was. And Paul talks about that in some of his letters. But anyway, the thing to note is Luke doesn't say that they said anything about warning Paul. So apparently the Spirit didn't, didn't give them anything to tell Paul in regards to that. And then in verses 10 through 12, we pick it up. And Luke said that we saved many days. Don't know how long, just many. And then there was a certain prophet named Agabus, who came down from Judea, and when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, and he bowed his own hands and feet. And he said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles, or the Romans. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those and those from that, from that place, they pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. There again, Agabus, the prophet. Where have we seen him before? He the side of a famine. Yes, he did. In Acts chapter 11, in verse 28, you can flip over there real quick if you want to. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 28, we meet him for the first time. And he was in Judea, so he was in Jerusalem, so he came down again. And we heard that Paul was down there. 11 and 28, then one of them, well, verse 27, and in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them named Agabus. He stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So Luke tells us Agabus is back. So we, could, we can learn from him and simply by saying, you can believe what this guy says. Pretty much. I mean, but how is a prophet verified? How do you know if somebody is a true prophet? If it comes true. If it comes true. That, that's the simple, uh, uh, that's proof is in the pudding, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's how it is. There, there are a lot of modern day prophets who, who write a lot of books. And, and if you go back and you read some of them, I was just, Linda and I were just talking about Nostradamus. I don't know if you know anything about him or seen anything about him. He's sort of a, secular prophet, you know, they talk about the things that Nostradamus has prophesied. Well, I've read some of his stuff, and you know what happens is, he has, he has written these things, and then the people that say he was a prophet, they look for things to match what he has written. Well, that's not prophecy, guys. That's affiliation. Uh, I mean, you can just like we were talking, he, he had prophesied about, about this big eagle 
and this big tower that had fallen. Well, anybody when 911 happened, you could simply say, well, the evils of status of America, I mean, that's a, the bird that represents us. And the Twin Towers was a tower that fell. Well, yeah, but how many towers fell between Nostradamus' time and 911? Now, if he would have said there will be two towers in the country of the eagle in the city of New York, which a bird will fly into, now that might got my attention. <laughs> but just to say an eagle and a tower and then to take that and make a prophecy out of it, that's a long stretch. That's a long stretch. So that's not, that's not prophecy. That's affiliation. But old Agabus, he didn't affiliate. The, you know, the famine didn't happen. And then they go back and say, well, I think Agabus said something about that famine. No, he told them before it happened. And they got ready and it happened. And now he's telling Paul, he tells Paul, takes his belt and does the demonstration for him. Jeremiah did a lot of that, didn't he? He would demonstrate using objects. And he bound his own feet. And he bound his own hands together. And he said, that's what's going to happen to the man who goes up to Jerusalem. Well, as I said before, he was, well, he had prophesied the, the famine in the Roman world. That goes in your one way. But his warning was a confirmation to Paul of what Christ had said his plans for Paul were. It was a confirmation to Paul because Paul knew yes, he that he had to go to Jerusalem. He knew that's what the plan was. Now, we're going to jump ahead a chapter. We'll skip ahead here one. In chapter 23 in verse 11, Paul lets the cat out of the bag. <clears throat> Chapter 23 and verse 11, Paul, Paul says, here's what Jesus told me. Luke said that the following night, the Lord stood by Paul. He stood by him, and the Lord said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me, where? So he had to go. You have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness where? At Rome. So you're going to go to Jerusalem so that they can turn you over to the Romans so that you will be sent to Rome that you might testify to me there. See why Paul never heeded the warnings? He, he knew this was coming. He knew what way ahead of him. He, he didn't know that Jesus was going to stand beside of him and tell him that. But he knew from the beginning what his mission was. And he knew he had to go to Jerusalem on your notes in order to reach Rome. That was the plan that God had in place to get Paul to Rome. They would have to go to Jerusalem and be bound so that he would be sent to Rome and appear in front of the king. Think, think about what Christ had told, had told Ananias. Remember when Paul was in Damascus and he was blind, and God sent Ananias up there to heal him. Remember what he said to Ananias about Paul? Remember what, what the Lord said to him? Flip back over there and look at it. Chapter 9. Huh? I thought we were somebody to say. <laughs> Must have been a name. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9. told him he would be somebody so that he would, you know, he'd send him up there so that Paul would be able to receive his sight. And he told Ananias, he said, you need to go up there and do that. And of course, Ananias said, I can't do that because this Paul is the one <clears throat> who's been killing Christians. And in verse 15, look what Ananias, look what the Lord told Ananias. And the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, there's the Romans, kings, there's Felix, 
and the children of Israel, there's the Jews. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. It was in the plan. Paul knew it was in the plan. So when they were warning him not to go to Jerusalem, Paul was just simply saying, you're doing nothing more than confirming what the Lord has already told me is going to, is going to happen. And then in verses 13 and 14, and then Paul answered and he said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Why well, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, he ceased. And then we said, the will of the Lord be done. They thought he was going to die in Jerusalem. That's what he was listening for. That's what he was listening for. The will of the Lord be done. They, they thought that would be the end of it. I mean, he'd had all these warnings. Don't you go up to Jerusalem. Don't you go up to Jerusalem. Ain't that what they said to Jesus? <laughs> they said, you know, they tried to stun you, and you're going back. Yeah, he went back. Because he knew that he had to go to Jerusalem because that's where he was going to die. He knew that's what it was. Paul probably thought he was going to die in Jerusalem. I mean, think about it. The, these, these prophets, the first town you land in, and they say, don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you. They're going to kill you. Get up there. They're going to find you. And then you leave that bunch and you go to the other bunch. And then, and then they say, oh, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And then Agabus, the major prophet, same one that, for, you know, that prophesied the famine. He says, Paul, this is what's going to happen if you go up to Jerusalem. You would have thought Paul would have said, well, I better not go. <laughs> no. Paul said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die in Jerusalem if that's what the Lord has planned. Why would a man be able to make such a bold statement? He's seen Jesus. I mean, on the road, Jesus revealed himself. And then three years into the wilderness, when he went into the Arabian Desert, remember we read that? That, that after he, he had, then he left, and then he told in the Galatians, in his epistle, he said, this gospel, I read that last week, this gospel did not come from man, but it came from Christ. Paul knew. Paul, you, you know, we say it this way, he's a winner either way. Paul wasn't worried about dying because he knew death was not final. He knew that what he was doing for God was what God had called him to do, and whether it ended at Jerusalem or whether it didn't, it didn't make any difference. That's why he would write in his letters to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's why he told that one about, you know, as far as I'm on that phrase, as far as I'm concerned, I just soon go and be with him. <laughs> But for your sakes, it's best that I stay here so that I can continue to do that. Paul had no fear of death. He had no fear of death because he knew. He knew what awaited him. And that's what they did not understand. So they were, they were trying to stop him, but, but it didn't work. And when they saw that it didn't work, they said, well, then we just said, the will of the Lord be done. Well, it was done. <laughs> And it was going to be done, and it was done. He knew how much they loved him when he said, "What well, you're, you're breaking my heart. Now, have you ever had to do something that somebody didn't want you to do, and they tried their best to keep you from doing it? And you, you knew it was going to hurt you to do it, but you knew that you had to do it, even though they didn't want you to do it. Have you ever been in a predicament like that, in a situation like that, that which it, it would have been easier to just say, okay, I won't do this, as to say, no, this has to be done. This has to be done. you got a choice. I heard a guy try to explain salvation at work, and he had good intents. He had good intents, but he was just a little off key. He was a little off key. And, and he said that there was this guy that, that he, he run a drawbridge. You may have heard the story. He, he run a drawbridge for a train to come across. That was his job. He, you've heard it, Mary. He sat in this shack and 
he, he worked the controls to take this bridge up and down. And one day he took his little boy to work with him, six year old son. He took him to work with him one day. And he wasn't paying attention to the kid, and you know what kids do. So when he got the alert that the train was coming, that he was going to have to raise the bridge to get, you know, or let the bridge, uh, bridge down, the ship had come through, and the train was coming, he was going to have to lower the bridge so that the train could come across. And when he, when he looked for his kid, he couldn't find him, but he saw him playing on the gears of the bridge. He was climbing around on the, on the gears that, that would take the bridge down. And he saw the train coming, and he saw his son playing. So he had to make a decision. If I don't put the bridge down, 300 or more people on that passenger train are going to crash into that, into that lake. But if I do push the button and put the bridge down, it's going to kill my son. So he sacrificed, he pushed the button. Well, that kind of sounds, that kind of sounds noble, but that ain't the choice that God made. God, God didn't say, if I do this, Jesus is going to die. Jesus said, or God said, Jesus will die. It's not going to be by accident. It, it's not going to be a choice that, that's going to be driven by what he did. It all come from God. It was his decision to send Christ to die on the cross. It had nothing to do with me and you being worthy. It was the fact it was his grace that he said, I'm going to kill my son, that these people may be saved. It wasn't by accident. That wasn't the predicament God was put in. So, so see, it doesn't take much to put something off course, does it? So when Paul knew he had to go up there, he said, it breaks my heart. And, and I guess probably what broke his heart is the fact that they didn't understand what he understood. That, that they didn't know what he knew about going to Jerusalem. So anyway, he knew his mission, and he knew that it was God's will. It was to be done on his behalf. And then they finally submitted and said, well, God's will be done. I, I tell you about the apostle, whether they had submitted or not, he would have went anyway. It, it, it was just going to happen. <laughs> but it was not going to talk him out of it. Does that make sense? If Jesus told him later on, I'm going to get ahead of it. It's all right. But he said, it, uh, Be a good cheer, Paul. So just as you witness to me in Jerusalem, you're going to go to Rome and witness. That's exactly right. Paul knew. Paul knew. What the, what the plan was. And Paul did not fear about God stopping that plan. Well, see, remember, in Gamaliel, before Paul was saved, when Gamaliel stood up in the council and they were, they were going to threaten the disciples, they, they threatened to kill them, no doubt, if they went back out and preached Jesus being alive. And, and of course, Peter and John said, we've got to do what God calls us to do. You know, if, if you don't think God's called us to do that, then that's, that's up to you. But we know God's called us to do that. So if we were to listen to men or listen to God, he pretty much said, we're listening to God because we know that's what God is calling us to do. And then when they had that big council meeting and again, he all stood up in the council and he named off there were three other guys, remember, that had come before Christ and claimed to be the Messiah. He didn't say that. He said he claimed to be somebody. Of course, you know who he was talking about. And he said they all died and their followers dispersed. And Gamaliel said, if this is the same thing, I'm paraphrasing, if this is the same thing, if this is not of God, then these followers will disperse. In other words, if Jesus is not alive, then it's not going to amount to anything. But, if Jesus is alive, you're going to be found fighting against the Almighty God. Remember he told them that? Well, Paul proved that Jesus is alive. And the fact that we're here today with this book talking about Christ is still proof that Jesus is alive. 
Because if Satan had to stop this book somewhere down the line, you and I would have never known about it. You and I would have never gotten the message. But it was God's plan to get you and I the message. And it will be his plan until the end of the ages. So nothing's going to stop that. Doesn't make any difference. Does that make sense? Questions or comments? What was that uh, on verse 10? What was the first one he... In verse 10, Agnes, he prophesied the famine. Okay. Mm -hmm. He prophesied the famine in the Roman world that he said would be under Claudius Caesar. While Caesar was in, was in office, I should say. He prophesied that. Where he was a true He's a true prophet. And Luke made that point. So when this true prophet came and told Paul, you go up to Jerusalem, this is going to happen to you. Well, Paul could have said, yeah, I know. <laughs> he, he just confirmed that what was going to happen because he had just said the Holy Spirit testifies in every city what awaits me when I get there. So why should this city be any different if the Holy Spirit is testified in every city? They were fulfilling prophecy by doing that. And didn't even realize it. Ain't God good. <laughs> oh, man. Anybody else? Question? Yeah. Anything? This is an exciting book, and it's going to get bad. It's going to get bad. Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here and these who have tuned us in. Oh, we look back, and it's just hard. It's just hard for us to put together that we're a part of this very thing that we're reading about. And, and we, look at, we look sometimes at this scripture and this history of this church as, as the apostle and as Luke has put it down for us and Agabus who, who prophesied about Paul. All, all of us are with you today. All those people are there with you. And, and they know that this scripture which you have handed down to us is true. And just as they believed it and they followed it, now it's our turn. So Father, I just pray that those who, who may have doubts or who may not Believe the Bible in its entirety. I pray that you move upon them by way of the Holy Spirit and help us to show them that, that those things which God had said would happen have happened and they're going to happen and they're going to keep happening because this book is, is his revelation to us, not only about the human race, but, but to the church in general. So we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged as Christians today to know that Satan has never been able to stop this thing, and he's not going to be able to stop it in our days. No matter how bad it is, how bad it looks, Father, you still got a plan, and it's still going to be carried out. And we give you the thanks that you're using us to be a part of it. Not only as disciples, but we are evangelists to every one that we share Christ with. That's one more person that will have to make a decision about it. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise and the glory for all of us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And the saints would say, we love you, Lord. Love you. Amen and amen. Pray for the service on Sunday. Thank you guys for tuning in. Come to church anytime that you have an opportunity. God bless you. Thank you, Michael.